Welcome back to the Horse Racing Show. Thank you for tuning in on uh, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Facebook. Be sure to follow us at Horse Racing Show as people have throughout the U.S. and in 17 countries. And it's a real honor now to have the only person, and I think the only person that will ever do this, own the Kentucky Derby winner, a Breeders' Cup Classic winner, and be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. We welcome in Mr. Jerry Moss. You had, and this is the 10th year anniversary of one of the great performances in Breeders' Cup history, the classic with Zenyatta. I'm sure that's going to be brought up many times in the next few weeks leading up to the classic at Santa Anita. Yeah, she um, she's still the only filly to ever do that. So uh, that's quite an accomplishment, you know. Until somebody comes along and does it, I think there will be. Uh, she stands alone, and uh, she's fully capable of doing all that. She was a great filly. What was it like when you're sitting in the stands watching her? You know, for me, I'd watch her and go, she can't do this. And here she comes again and did it 19 out of 20 times. It, it, you know, as my dad said, she was like the Silky Sullivan of her time. Young people Google it. He was this great come from behind runner back in the fifties who would just, you know, people would think he's out of it. And then she would, he would win it. And she did the same thing. It was amazing. I mean, quite amazing. Because many times I say, well, let's go, Mike. Come on, let's go. And he'd hold on, hold on, hold on. And then finally let her go. And she was amazing. Just incredible. Did you ever get nervous that she may not be able to do it and then she would? Yeah. Oh, sure. Plenty of times. She faced some really good fillies. And uh, one of them was very fast and had her beat all the way down the line until she finally came up and won by, you know, Big nose, you know, and incredible. And Mike always said when she won by a nose, it always meant that it was not that big a nose. It was a bigger nose in a sense. <laughs> she had, she knew that he knew that she had all the guts to win. So uh, he wasn't afraid to let her out. Zenyatta name for an album from the police. Uh, you're friends with Sting, and the police was one of the, the many great acts that recorded with A&M Records that you co-founded with Herb Alpert. Um, right. and, and, you know, she had a little dance to her, Jerry. I mean, you know, I'd uh -huh. watch her come out. She looked like she was dancing a little bit. It looked like it's why she, she let off a lot of steam doing that. She got rid of a lot of, you know, early morning uh, stuff when she had her little dance. And it was great because the audience always watched for it. And when she did it, they got applause, you know. She was, she was just special. And when she came out, the crowd came out. It was really great to see it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if there's been maybe American Pharaoh that I can remember in covering this sport for a long time uh, as loved as Zenyatta. You know, people that barely knew horse racing suddenly became uh, Zenyatta fans. Right, that was it. That was it. She, uh, she had a lot of people. She was just amazing. And it was John's way of doing it because John Sheriff, our trainer, opened up the back door in a way when he allowed people to come on the track in the morning and watch her train. And uh, soon we had 100 people out there. Yeah. And the crowd just got bigger and bigger. And, and like you say, everybody wanted to see her and, uh, you, take you know, picture. And, and take a picture. And you guys were always so open to it. Uh, you know, I think that opened it up for a lot. I don't know. I, in some ways, to me, you might have been the forerunner for the way they open things up with American Pharaoh a lot of times. You know, you knew you had a special horse, and the public wanted to see a special horse. The public did. And, you know, everybody was very, very respectful. Nobody shoved anything in their mouth. Yeah. That was what we were concerned about, somebody putting something in their mouth. Right. So uh, if everybody cooled that part, you know, every, everything was fine. Everything was great. They petted her. They did everything. They loved her. They took pictures with her. Everything was great, but don't put anything in her mouth, please. That's right. No, no peppermints. No, no apples or carrots. You may mean well, no. but don't. Don't do it around any horse. That's right. Yeah, I mean, sometimes we go and we give somebody a, 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 a something, a carrot or something, a give her, you know. But we would watch the way it was done. Yeah. But uh, nobody tried anything in those days. We're talking with Jerry Moss. Uh, he's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, uh, a record executive that co-founded A&M Records with Herb Alpert, another one of the legends, and, of course, owned, among others, Giacomo. And uh, as we're talking about Zenyatta, and, Jerry, how do you go into the horse racing business? Was that something growing up in uh, New York that uh, you were into as well as music? 
No, it, it happened when it happened through the record business, actually. Nate Duroff, who is a manufacturer of of our records, uh, said that uh, somebody had retired and decided to become a trainer at, at Hollywood Park uh, at Santa Anita, and uh, would we claim a horse with him? And of course, I said, "No, um, come on, Nate. I'm just too busy. I can't do that." So Nate had a slight stroke, and I'm in the hospital with him, and I'm standing there with a balloon, and he says, "Now that I'm coming out, you can train a horse with me. You can, you can, you can claim a horse with me." I said, "Okay, all right, let's do one. See what happens." So the first horse we claimed actually won a race two races later, and uh, made us feel real good, Herb and I, and we kept it up till eventually the a friend of ours, Bert Bacharach said to us, you guys are too classy to claim horses. You got to buy a horse. So we ended up asking this trader to buy a horse for us. And he bought a horse that was pretty good, but had been injured. And the horse never quite lived up to itself. So uh, Herbie decided to get out and he didn't come back. He came back with his brother a little bit, but uh, I liked it. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the bringing artists to the track and talking to them. Uh, during the long break, you know, and it was fun. Yeah, you know, and there's, uh, I guess there's a certain rhythm <laughs> to horse racing. Uh, you know, oh, yeah. In the morning, the track, and the whole the whole atmosphere. And Well, the mornings are a little difficult now because the mornings are at Santa Anita, and that's a, that's a big drive for us. Where yeah. Hollywood Park was fantastic. Hollywood Park was 20 minutes. Yeah. I miss Hollywood Park. I look at it when I'm flying into LAX. Well, I can't even see it now, but you know, I used to be able to see at least the outline of the track even after they tore the grandstand down. Right, right. Yeah, it was, it's gone. It's um, literally gone. No no more Hollywood Park. That's a, not, not, a, not a question about it. Your your friendship, with, I mean, you know, it's amazing. I was looking back, and I have so many A&M records, by the way. I remember my oh. sister would learn to play the piano. Uh, she's very talented at that, listening to the Carpenters. Mm, carpenters are big. And, and then, and I used to do a show when I was a kid, Jerry. I had a little radio show, and it was a sports show. And I played Nothing from Nothing by Billy Preston. Yeah, Billy, Billy Preston was a great artist. Great yeah, artist. He and, wrote Beautiful, too. Yeah, and, and then, uh, and then I've got Peter Frampton. I think every everybody in college I in the 70s. The other night. Is that right? <laughs> Peter played the forum, and he was fantastic. He was unbelievable. You know, it was just great to see him again. Everybody has Frampton Comes Alive. I think that double album. If you were if you were in college or in high school in the seventies, don't they? Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, Mike Myers say they gave it away with every box of Tide in the supermarket. <laughs> box of Tide. That's right. That's a throwback, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> And, and anyway, the, it's, and, uh, it was a big, it was a big deal. It was a, that album started selling fifty thousand records a day, and it didn't stop the whole year. Well, you know what amazed me is just looking back on all this, and I had to read up on some of it myself. I forgot about like Cocker and the uh, the Flying Burrito Brothers, uh, Carol King, the Go Go's, Amy Grant. I mean, this is quite an eclectic mix uh, that you had uh, at A and M Records. What was that whole process like when you're bringing all this together in the sixties and seventies? I think the idea was that we wanted people that could give us something different, you know, give us a different slant on things. And uh, we jumped on that pretty hard. And, uh, you know, we got an artist like Cat Stevens, and who was a fantastic artist, and uh, just did things differently. And uh, didn't just have hit records, had, but, but it created a style in itself of, of its own. And uh, he had a lot to say, and he was great. He sold two real big records for us. I don't know if the record business today would, would be able to do what you guys did at A&M. I mean, everything seems pretty formulaic from from country to pop to rock to whatever's going on out there. The genres all kind of seem like the same people are doing the same thing over and over. I may be wrong, but I, I just don't see like a lot of different mixes out there. Uh, you're, you're probably right. I don't pay much attention to it, so I don't see much of it at all. My son's in it. And I keep asking him, how's it going? What's going on? You know, about that part. But, uh, you know, in regard to the business, I don't see the same thing happening. You know, I see a, well, you don't have records anymore. People aren't selling records. Yeah. People are selling, you know, basically how many how many tunes do they get on, how many listens do they get on a particular song? And it's not a question of uh, 
a sale anymore. It's a question of how many how many how many versions he get played. You know, it's it's not the same. Sometimes progress isn't always progress, in my opinion. I, I agree with you. I agree with you. But um, you know, I, I would I would I would I just like it all. But uh, I, I, we play the music a lot in the car. But well, you just don't hear what what I used to hear. You know, and somebody was a little different. Yeah. Well, you know what? You might be the only guy that actually had the Carpenters and then the Flying Burrito Brothers. Now, you talk about opposite ends of, of different kind of creativity. See, that's what always impressed me about A&M and the independent spirit that you had. Well, Flying Burritos were a very special group. They had a guy in there, and I, I can't remember his name right now, but he was just so creative and wrote great song. Uh I just can't remember his name. Graham Parsons and some of those. Parsons, yeah, that was a guy. Yeah, yeah, he was a guy. And uh, Graham was very talented. And unfortunately, he didn't live very long. But he was an amazing guy and very talented and wrote some great songs. And, and, and Karen Carpenter had one of the purest voices. I mean, she just had a voice. She was unbelievable, unbelievable, and just amazing how big she was. I don't know if she ever knew how big an artist she was. Yeah. You know, she was just so big. So incredible. Now, Every the, one of their records. Oh, yeah. And then your friendship with the police and specifically with Sting, who you named Giacomo after. Well, that's his, that's his firstborn son. The last son he had was named Giacomo. Okay. And so we, we started naming it after Sting songs, you know, and Sting stuff. Uh -huh. So after that, it became Zenyatta and then a bunch of other stuff. But... Uh, Giacomo, I, know, I see today, he's a grown man, and he's an interesting kid, and he's just a great kid, and uh, this thing was amazing. He, you know, he, and it, it, it show you how amazing this kid is, he almost went to this place called the uh, Moreland City Dance thing, and it was a shooting there, and uh, he just didn't go that night. The night of the shooting, he just decided he had a headache, and he better stay home. Oh, thank God. But he yeah. loves country music, and he, he loved country music and that's where we was hang out he know? does <laughs> that's yeah. interesting is that sting's son likes country music i don't know why it is. <laughs> yeah, it is. I, don't, I don't remember any country acts on the a and m level, level i guess the burrito brothers parsons they were doing some kind of different kind of country but uh, yeah they got dressed up at nudies and uh, you know they did their little country thing once in a while but we 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 did have a country publishing company for a while but uh, that, that was very successful but that was it did Sting come out to the races with you much? I can't remember if he was there. I remember him sending a personal video congratulations to you at one of the Eclipse Awards that I hosted, but I don't remember right. him coming to the track. I don't know if he ever personally saw Zenyatta or Giacomo run. Well, he had some horses early on in his career. He had a horse or two. And uh, he used to go to the track to see them, and uh, it became a liability, obviously. And if they didn't win, they cost money. So... Uh, he couldn't wait to get out of the business in a way, you know. But uh, he still, he still, when he was in when he was in uh, Lexington recently, or well, it was, had to be uh, the other town uh, when he was in um, Kentucky recently, playing in front of forty thousand people. Yeah, he said, uh, he said, "I'm not familiar with this town." He said, "But my son Giacomo probably is." And when he said the word Giacomo, <laughs> the audience went crazy. Gave him a big hand. Well, you know, as the as the winner of the Kentucky Derby in 2005 with the 50-to-1 shot Giacomo, uh, I wonder, did any of your friends, did that impress any of your friends in the music business that were just barely new horse racing? Because now suddenly you win the Kentucky Derby. Most people know what the Kentucky Derby is, even if they've never followed horse racing. Right. Oh, well, it, was, it was a big deal. You know, I, you know, living in Hollywood is, uh, you know, as I do, and, People would say to me, well, you won your Oscar, kid, you know? Yeah. Like, that was your Oscar, you know? You won the Kentucky Derby. It gives you something to put put in your memo. But uh, it was a great time. It was great fun. And it was exciting as hell and a big surprise. And you stuck the winning ticket, or what would become the winning ticket, uh, one of them, in the boot of jockey Mike Smith uh, just as he was getting into the saddle. Yeah, I said, I've seen this in the movie sometimes. I'm going to do this. Maybe it's good luck. So I shoved two tickets in his boot, and uh, I gave the tickets away to people because I thought that would be good 
you know, sort of like paraphernalia, you know, it's like, a, uh, you know, at least I went there and it was, I got a hundred dollar ticket. So I got a hundred dollar ticket in those days meant five grand. Yeah. Yeah. It was 50 to one. So, um, just amazing. Amazing. Uh, the woman that took us around, you know, they, they have volunteers that take you around the track because you're not used to operating in the Derby area, the Churchill Downs. And I said, do you ever take a winner around? And they said, no. Well, until then, I gave her a ticket. And so she got she got five grand, and a lot of uh, staff got five grand of tickets. To, it was just nothing at the time. That's, a, that's the greatest I, tip ever. <laughs> yeah, it's a good tip. You're absolutely right. You but, thought that you had a kind of feeling. I, I think I read this somewhere. I heard you afterwards. You all thought that Giacomo certainly was being way overlooked at fifty to one. You thought, uh, based on some, you know, hadn't really had his chance to run his race in California, that he might have a shot with the pace of the Derby of 05 to win, and he did, of course. Well, I thought he was getting better every race, and uh, you know, you, you have a chance. You know, the horse came in like sixteenth in the in the standings. Because he, he, all of his points were made when he came in second or third or fourth in other races, uh, lead-up races. But the point was, we he, he had a chance to go to the Derby, and we said, "Let's go to the Derby. We, we never know if we're going to go to the Derby or not. Let's go." And that cost you fifty grand to get into the Derby. I think it still does. I think it costs yeah. you that much. So we decided to go for it, and uh, he ended up winning the race. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> that. Uh... That, you've had two special horses. Do you, your horses. How many horses do you still own, Jerry? Oh, God, it's got to be close to 20 now. I think we bought just bought six more. So we're still trying. We still believe, you know, and uh, we, we, get, we seem to be getting better at it. We had a horse win a uh, $250,000 race at Del Mar on closing day, so that was pretty good. And uh, will you be going to the Breeders' Cup yourself? Will you be there at Santa Anita in a few weeks? We'll be in town. I still don't know if I'm going or not. It depends on a horse and race and thing on that, but I, I doubt it. At this point, it looks like I'm not going to be there. I was looking back. 2005 was really. Sp- I believe that was also the year you went in the in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with Herb Albert. Was there yeah, about that's the, true. That's you win, true. You win the Derby and you go in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. M- most of your neighbors, I don't care where they live in the L.A. area, are, it's going to be tough to top that year. Yeah, that was a big year. I guess that was a big year for us. And I, it was the year I got to be 70 years old, too. So, uh, amazing. Amazing. So, you can figure out how old I am now. Yeah, but you're still looking good and going strong, aren't you? you still look, going strong. Got to yeah. keep going. Got to yeah. keep going. God time. bless. That's the main thing. Did you, you know, I'm sure people ask, like, see, I, I don't want to get too geeky about all this A&M Records thing, but it just fascinates me because I bought so many of your records over the years. Uh, you, you know, w- was there was there ever a, was there ever anybody so difficult you just couldn't work with anymore? I don't think so. I think everybody was easy to de- deal with. Uh, I think musicians are the easiest people in the world to deal with. And uh, even though they're against you in some cases, they 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 really believe if you say something to them, they they know that you have your their best interest in mind and you're trying to sell them more records. So I, I think from the standpoint of musicians, every one of them from Burt Bacharach to Peter Frampton, they were all very helpful, all very successful and all very helpful. So that's interesting with the different group, like I say, such an eclectic mix at times of, uh, you know, pop and rock and uh, somewhere in between uh, how everybody was successful. It may, be, it may be easier than, although some of the trainers you've had, like John Sheriffs, are such easygoing guys, too, to get along with. I always love to interview and talk to them. Um, yeah. You know, I guess you, it seemed like Jerry Moss would get along with everybody, to be honest, the few times I've been I, I around would, you. I would try. I would try, you know, and, uh, and usually it came through. And, uh, you know, the McCaffins in, uh, in o- Ocala were pretty much fun, too, Yeah. for a while. But uh, one of them passed away recently, and uh, I don't think we're sending any horses there anymore, but uh, they were great guys at the time, wonderful guys. And... Uh, do you ever go back and, and have your picture taken at the statue of at Santa Anita of Zenyatta? If I can get, get somebody to go by there, it's, just, it's, it's another little walk, you know, so a lot of people, they're a little lazy. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a, the last time I was there about a year ago at Santa Anita, I was looking at people lining up and I realized that I'd walk by it many times. I knew it was a Zenyatta statue, but then you see people out there when the race day starts, uh, you know, in the mornings, I mean, 
uh, you know, having their picture taken. And I, I just think it's great the memory that she still brings to people, as, as does Giacomo. I mean, you've had two of the more interesting horses in the last uh, 25 years, Jerry. That's true. That's true, actually. Isn't it? I'm, I'm, I'm glad, uh, you know, they're, they're that interested to people and uh, they keep looking for them and they keep their interest going. Unfortunately, Giacomo was a sire and I don't think he produced a grade one winner, so his sire days didn't last very long and I understand he recently passed away, but I'm not sure. You know, it was, it was again, you know, a moment that you never forget that uh, to win and be one of the, 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 a long shot that probably shouldn't have been, but he's still like tied for third as the long shot uh, winner of the Kentucky Derby. And have Country House moved ahead of him this year, you know, when he was declared the Derby winner. Oh, yeah, that was a, that was a difficult Derby. That was the one difficult, I think it was very difficult for the stewards and difficult for everybody involved. Yeah, it's, it's kind of been a difficult year, hasn't it, for horse racing overall? Well, you know, Santa Anita and things. We've talked about it on the show many times. But, you know, it's it's. Uh, I always like to point out to people the livelihood of all the people that are involved around the racetrack. That, you know, for those that are against horse racing, all the people that would lose their jobs. Don't look at just the owners and the, and the trainers. And these people don't know anything else. You know, they know horses. They don't know anything else. They would be really destitute without the racing. Every year, you know, every year there's a schedule and every year there's, you can change your job inside of a barn or two, but they don't go far away. You know, they don't, they don't go far away. And uh, people at Hollywood Park just came back, to, you know, they're, they're still working at uh, Santa Anita, but that's the L.A. group. There's about 500 or 600 of them and just good around horses. Yeah. And they, they, they don't know anything else. And they have nowhere else to go. It would be no, no, nothing to do with these people. Do you have, I, I guess, obviously, Zenyatta and Giacomo, I guess, would be your two favorite horses of all your horses? They are. They are. They are. T too many musicians to pick a favorite one or two or three? Well, I love Peter Frampton. You know, he's, he, was a, he was great to us the other night when we saw him, and uh, it's always fun to see him. And, uh, and Sting, of course, is just the most, yeah. one of the most talented people I've ever met. You know, he keeps coming up with records and hits and all that stuff later in the years. He's been hot for 28 years. You know, he's an amazing artist. And, uh, you know, so many people. Uh, Janet Jackson was fantastic, you know. I mean, get to see her once in a while. So, I mean, I've just been lucky. And, uh, you know, it's just been fun. It's been a lot of fun being in the music business and the horse business. The both of them kind of work together, you know. Well, I always appreciate it is when I would host the Eclipse Awards and the Zenyatta table for two of the years was right in front of me. So I would look at you and Mike Smith and John Sheriffs, and if you guys laughed at a few of my jokes, I figured I was doing okay. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And then uh, the you, last year we actually won finally Horse of the Year. Yeah. I remember that well. That, that was a great moment. And, and they had the video of Sting up there that congratulating you, I believe. That was yeah, the that year, was, too. Yeah, that was the year before. I think it was really yeah, great. Yeah. That, that was wonderful times, and, and I hope you have continued success, and I get to interview you at another Breeders' Cup in the future, Jerry. It would be fantastic, Mike. Thank you so much. Jerry, thank you so much for being with us. I appreciate it, Kenny. Thank you so much. All right. See you soon, my friend. Take, thank you. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. The legendary Jerry Moss, the only man to win a Kentucky Derby, a Breeders' Cup Classic, and be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And we'll be back with more. Janine Edwards just ahead here on the Horse Racing Show. Stay with us.